For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is David Hudson. I'm a third generation Phoenix cotton farmer. Uh, I got involved in this quest about 1975 uh, in doing analytical work on natural products on our farm. I became very intrigued with the chemistries I was seeing because in fact the, the chemistry was not in fact what the analytical data was saying it was. In other words, I would send the material to a lab to have them tell me what was there and they would tell me one thing and then when I performed the chemistries on it and, and actually saw the chemistries, it was something totally different. And so, you know, my interest in whatever this material was was quite profound. Uh, you have to understand, I am not a chemist. I have never studied physics. I've never studied chemistry. I'm just the guy that paid for everything. <laughs> uh, I, I do find that present, I am teaching some of the top physicists in the country. I'm, I'm, working, I'm working with Westinghouse and GE and people like this. They bring in their top physicists. and. You know, when you finally get up to a level of understanding, like when I spoke down in, in Santa Barbara, I was explaining superconductivity to him, and, and a man was sitting in the front row, just kept nodding his head, nodding his head. And uh, after I finished, the gentleman came up, and he says, Dave, I, I worked with Bardeen of Bardeen, Cooper, and Schreifer at his laboratories, and, you know, this is the Nobel laureate for the theory of superconductivity. And he said, he said your explanation of superconductivity is very, very accurate very correct, and I find it just profound that some farmer would understand it. <laughs> so, so, when you do get up to the level of understanding where you are talking to people who do know their business, then they appreciate this, otherwise it, they don't. So, I, you know, if you do understand this, you are up in the top 1%, you know, you're, you're very, very elevated, which says a lot for your teacher. I want you to know that in all of my work in science that I have never encountered anyone who understood it uh, as clearly and precisely as the tapes that I listened to this afternoon of Ramtha making a presentation. I can only tell you that it's very embarrassing to hear my name mentioned in the presentation and then the jokes that are being made about me. <laughs> So, you know, I think it's important for the people who don't know how I am that, uh, that if, if the ones who've already heard this will bear with me a little bit while I go through a little of the background. Uh, as I begin to investigate this unknown material, basically the area that drew me very strongly into it was our work with soils. And uh, we were actually have a problem in Arizona called, it's a, a sodium problem. And we have the high sodic soils, which means the soils have a lot of sodium in it. And so we were actually buying sulfuric acid from the mines and bringing it in, in in tanker trucks and injecting it on our soils in six inch ribbons in the soil at 30 tons to the acre. Now this was 93% sulfuric acid, 30 tons to the acre. Uh, in doing this, what would happen then we use irrigated agriculture, we don't get rainfall like you people here. We get about as much rainfall in a year as you get in two or three days here. And so we were actually putting it on our soils and putting the irrigation water on behind the, the tractors. And as this water ran across the field, it would hit this acid and the acid would just froth and foam and bubble and suds. But what we were doing is we were making sodium sulfate, which is called a white alkali, out of sodium, which is a black alkali. And the white alkali was leachable. The water would dissolve the white alkali and wash it out of our soils. And so we're able to leach the, the white alkali out of a topsoil. In doing that leaching, one of the things we had to be very careful about is you have to be sure that there's enough buffer substance, something that keeps the pH stable in the soil. And so we had to find out whether there was a lot of calcium carbonate in our soil. Because if there wasn't a lot of calcium carbonate, what would happen is you put the sulfuric acid on, it would really drop the pH, and then you couldn't produce anything. You could, gener you could germinate the seed, but the plant would get about this big and just quit growing. It just had none of the trace nutrients that are associated with with the crops we were raising in Arizona. And so in the investigation of what I had in my soil, I kept running up against this stuff, you know, whatever this stuff was. So finally I just committed, well, I'm gonna do an investigation of this material. I'm gonna find out what this stuff is. 
Now, keep in mind, I know nothing about chemistry, nothing at all. I mean, I just take it to commercial laboratories, they run the work. So we actually got this material, dissolved it out of the ore, and basically our, our ore, our, our soil is, is a decomposed rock. It's just dirt. There's no topsoil. There's no organic material. It's just dirt. So we took the dirt, we dissolved it in acid, and we got it in solution. Then we added powdered zinc to the acid, and it precipitated out as a black. And we filtered the black out on a filter paper and got it totally dried. We set it out in the sunlight to dry. And as it dried in the sunlight, it exploded. <laughs> now, this, this didn't make any sense. You know, it, it, how could you have an explosion of a metal? It didn't make any sense at all. And so we did it again. We got it all in solution. We added powder zinc. It came out as kind of this bluish black precipitate. We filtered it out, put it out in the sun, and as we dried it, it exploded. But we got to looking, and, and what had happened is our Pyrex, um, or our, our porcelain filtering funnel, was fractured and cracked from the heat. And uh, we said, well, you know, this is really interesting because it doesn't seem like there's any explosion or an implosion. It's just tremendous release of short wavelength light. And I said, you know, whatever is going on, this is not like any explosion or explosion I've ever seen. So what we did is we actually took a brand new pencil that had not been sharpened, and we stood the pencil on its end next to this filter. We put the filter out to dry, and as it dried, it exploded. But when it did, it burnt the pencil about one-third in two, but it didn't knock the pencil over. Now this, this just is not explainable. It's not explainable with any understanding of chemistry that we had. It was like there was a tremendous release of, of energy from this material, whatever it was, whatever the stuff was. Tremendous release of light, but it was like 50,000 flash bulbs all being ignited all at the same time. Just a tremendous burst of heat, but no gas. And this just didn't make any sense at all. I was perplexed. The people working with me were perplexed. And I said, this just doesn't make any sense at all. And I sent it to commercial laboratories. And I say, what's in this stuff? Now, do you understand? I took it out of the sunlight and I dried it inside. And it doesn't explode. So I dried it inside, sent it to commercial laboratories for analysis. And they told me I had iron, silicon, aluminum. Now, this is just the, the, the mundane, lowly, ordinary elements of the earth. Just about any dirt you pick up has iron, silicon, aluminum in it. And I said, but iron, silicon, aluminum don't explode. And you can't tell me a compound you can make them into that explodes. And they said, well, that's right. And I said, and when it's totally dried, it will not redissolve in any acid. They said, gee, is that right? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, it's iron, silicon, aluminum. <laughs> so anyway, I, I did go back to finally to Cornell University, where there was an expert that took me months and months to locate but a man who claimed to be an expert on metals analysis. And when I got it back at Cornell University, he put it on this tremendous, and I say tremendous, it was a huge, huge instrument. But behind glass doors, here was these eight different micro, micro, uh, microscopy heads that actually did x-ray diffraction, x-ray fluorescence, tunneling microscopy. All these different types of analysis were all set up on the one sample. And he says, Dave, we can analyze down to three to five parts per billion on any material above chlorine on the periodic table. I said, well, gee, this, this will solve it once and for all. We'll find out really what I got here. So he put it on there, turns the machine on. He says, Dave, you've got iron, silicon, aluminum. <laughs> I said, no, sir, I do not have iron, silicon, aluminum. You know, there, there's, you cannot come up with a compound of iron, silicon, aluminum that's a blue-black in color. And he looked it up in the CRC and he says, well, there's ferro-ferro-cyanide and there's, you know. I said, but that's, that doesn't have the chemical properties this has. So finally I got so frustrated. I said, well, do you have a chemistry lab around here we can go to work? I want to show you how this stuff reacts in, in acids. So he took it over to a chemistry lab and we played with this for, for like four or five hours. And I was finally able to remove all the silica, all the iron, and all the aluminum. And I still had 98% of the sample left. <laughs> and now he puts it on his microprobe and he says, Dave, you have pure nothing. 
Now, I, I want you people to understand this is really, really difficult to get pure nothing because in, in metals refinement, you can get 99.8, 99.9, 99.99, 99.999, 99 but you cannot buy 100.00 because even the, the high technology metallurgists know that you always have impurity atoms. But we were fortunate enough, we were able to get rid of all the iron, all the silicon, all the aluminum, and then he says, Dave, there is no absorption or emission spectra in this sample that agrees with any standards we have here at Cornell University. And I said, wait a minute, aren't you the man that said you could analyze down to three to five parts per billion? I don't want to know parts per billion. I have 100% something, and I want to know what that is. And he just said, Dave, I can't help you. I don't know what it is. So I came back to Arizona, and we were doing some metallurgical studies with it. We found out that, it, that when we melted it with lead, it was settled at the bottom of lead. So it had a specific gravity that was heavier than lead. And yet, when we brought it into the lead and we put it on a bone ash coupel, which is what they use in metallurgy, the bone ash coupel absorbs all the lead and leaves a little bead of gold and silver. I said, well, let's put it on the coupel and coupel it down. Well, when we coupel it down, there was nothing left. So it wasn't gold and silver. But then we actually took known amounts of gold and we put it in our solution and we repeatedly evaporated that and we coupel that down and we got no gold or silver. So we weren't able to recover even the gold we put into it. <laughs> then I took solutions containing this, whatever it was, and I put known amounts of gold in the solution and repeatedly evaporated it down over and over and over. And then I took that solution up, we extracted it with MIBK, fed it into atomic absorption, and it now contains no gold or silver. And then I put gold in it. So. I asked the commercial laboratory doing the AA analysis, I said, doesn't this bother you? <laughs> you know, is it of concern to you that we took this amount of gold, we put it into this solution, we now have it in, extracted into MIBK, it's a colored solution, we feed it in the AA and it doesn't read. Doesn't that bother you? And they said, not at all. <laughs> they said, we're running a procedure that was given to us when we bought this machine. It's the standard in the industry. And that's what we're being paid to report. And I said, but doesn't it bother you that it's accurate, you know, or not accurate? And they said, not at all. They, they said, in fact, Dave, we don't even have to allow you in our laboratory, and so would you please leave? <laughs> now, the gentleman back at Cornell University had also said, Dave, if you'll give us $350,000, we'll put some graduate students to studying it. And I decided for $350,000, I can figure out more than you can figure out. <laughs> and I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, about 1979, I went to uh, this Siegfried, who was a German uh, fellow with a spectroscopy machine in Phoenix. And he had actually worked for about 27 years in emission spectroscopy. He was the senior. Uh, uh, equipment designer with Lab Test Industries, he actually engineered and blueprinted and designed emission spec spectroscopic equipment, and then he went out in the field and set them up and made them work for specialty orders that came into Lab Test down in LA. And when he retired from the company, he had designed and built a three and a half meter machine. And this is a huge machine. Uh, for most of you who are familiar with emission spectroscopy, most machines that are in the universities are about one and a half meter, and this one was three and a half meter, which means the arc was huge, you know, that, that the light is projected on when it does the diffraction experiment. And the great thing about a three and a half meter emission spectroscopy machine is it really separates the line spectra when it goes through the machine. And so I went to him and I told him that I would like for him to run these procedures that were in the Soviet book that I had been given by the metallurgist, and he says, well, Dave, uh, this is all worthless information you're bringing me because, see, we Germans are the best metallurgists. And he said, I studied over in Dortmund, West Germany, and the West Germans are far ahead of the rest of the world in, in metallurgy, and this isn't necessary to do the kind of burn times that, this, that the, the Soviet book says. He says, 15 seconds is the longest burn time you need to run on a sample. That's the standard in the industry. 
And when you understand that the temperature in the DC arc is 5,500 degrees centigrade, now that's basically the temperature of the sun, and he says when you put an element on here and strike the arc in the first 15 seconds, everything there boils away. And he says you read it as it boils away, you actually read it in the DC arc. He says that light goes to the prisms, is broken up into the spectra, and you find out which elements are there. He says, so Dave, you know, the Russian book says you burn it for 300 seconds. He said, this is preposterous. In 15 seconds, we get everything. And I said, well, just, you know, this is the Soviet Academy of Sciences, the Vernatsky Institute for Precious Metal Research, a government-funded laboratory that says burn it for 300 seconds. So just do me a favor, and let's just spend my money and burn it for 300 seconds. <laughs> And so he said, okay, Dave, you know, so he sent to West Germany, had all the orifices built to do the spectroscopic analysis, and you actually have to put an inert gas around the carbon electrode so when you strike the arc, air doesn't get the electrode and oxidize the carbon. And so he said, Dave, we'll burn it for 300 seconds, but he said, this is absolutely worthless. It's just throwing your money down the drain. And I said, well, throw my money down the drain. I have to see it. Well, when he set this machine up and did it the way the Soviet Academy of Sciences said, he struck the arc and in the first 15 seconds, we read iron, silica, aluminum, traces of calcium, traces of titanium, and that was it. Nothing else. But you look in while that arc is still burning and sitting there on the electrode is a glowing white ball of material. And it's still, still sitting there on top of the electrode. And the arc's just going all around it, and it's just sitting there, nothing reading. And it doesn't read for 20 seconds, it doesn't read for 25 seconds, it doesn't read for 30 seconds, it doesn't read for 35 seconds, it doesn't read for 40 seconds, 45 seconds, 50 seconds, 55 seconds, 60 seconds, 65 seconds, and then at 70 seconds, Exactly when the Soviet Academy of Sciences book said it would read, palladium begins to read. And then platinum, and then ruthenium, and then rhodium, and then iridium, and then osmium. They actually read in the sequence of their boiling temperatures, exactly as the Soviet Academy of Sciences said they would read. Now, you know, the guy just says, my gosh, Dave, get out of my lab. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually sent me away while he reproduced this work for about three and a half weeks, all on his own. And he called him back up, and actually he didn't call, his wife called me up. And she says, Dave, Siegfried wants me to call and apologize. Now Siegfried, you know, German ego, he couldn't call me and apologize for himself. He had his wife call me. <laughs> anyway, he, he ran this material over and over and over, and he checked every spectral line. He wanted to be absolutely certain it was this material. He checked every possible interference. And he says, Dave, it's these elements. It is these elements. Well, I came back and worked with him about two years after that, and we actually worked with this and worked with it until we got, we actually had standards that exactly equaled our unknown material. Now, one of the things that really perplexed us about this material is when we buy standards of rhodium and iridium and ruthenium, we put them on the electrode and we strike the arc, they read. And they read for the first 15 seconds and then they stop reading. But if you look in on the electrode, there's a glowing white ball of metal. And it doesn't read from 15 seconds until 70 seconds. There's nothing reading at all. And then at 70 seconds, it begins to read again. And it reads palladium, platinum, ruthenium, rhodium, iridium, and osmium. In exactly the same ratio. And in fact, 85% of the metal read in the late burn time not in the early burn time. Only about 15% was reading in the early burn time. And so all the commercial spectroscopists in this country who are actually working with these elements are reporting to you 15% of the sample and telling you it's 100%. But it's not. There's a whole bunch more than this there. 
So I decided, well, look, this is all well and good, but I'm spending lots of money. I got about 70, 80,000 in this thing now with all the time and effort and standards and PK blenders and, and buffers and, you know, over and over and over running this, paying him for all this time for all these years. I said, look, let's just cut to the chase. Let's go right where all the, the best analysis we can get in this country. What is the very best analysis available at any price? And they said, well, Dave, that would be neutron activation. I said, okay, neutron activation it is. Where do we get it done? Well, you have to go to a government lab to get neutron activation, you know. So I find that most of the labs of the U.S. were all tied up for like a year and a half, two years in advance. So we found out that Harwell Labs over in London would do the analysis for us. So what we did is we burned our sample for 69 seconds and just one second before it should start reading these elements, we turn it off. We take our knife and we dig out of the carbon electrode this little glowing white bead now that's gone black because it's cooled off. And we dig it out, we put it in a bag and we send it off to Harwell Laboratories. Now we assume that this is going to some place where they do nuclear analysis. This has nothing to do with electrons way out on the outside. You know, this has to do with the nucleus itself, the protons and the neutrons of the nucleus. And these guys send energy into the nucleus and they read the resonance spectra of the nucleus itself. Now this is absolutely certain to read this stuff, right? So we get a report back and it says no precious elements detected. Now, now this, is, this just really, really frustrates everybody. We say, my God, are we literally making these elements under this DC arc? Or is it that they exist in some other state that we don't know about? Now the concept of having a change in the nuclear state never entered our minds. You know, it has to be something in the electron structure. And yet the nucleus doesn't read. And I decided, you know, enough of the spectroscopy. I know how much is here now. We've actually done quantitative analysis. Our analysis said that the material that we we're starting with had six to eight ounces per ton of palladium, 12 to 13 ounces per ton of platinum, 150 ounces per ton of osmium, 250 ounces per ton of ruthenium, 600 ounces per ton of iridium, and 1,200 ounces per ton of rhodium. Now, to give you some idea of what this means, the best known deposit in the world is now being mined in South Africa, where they go a half mile under the ground and they follow an 18 inch seam of rock and they bring out this rock that contains one third of one ounce per ton of all the platinum group elements. And our material contains an excess of 2,400 ounces per ton of the platinum group elements. And so, needless to say, the numbers are so preposterous, so absolutely ridiculous that I said, you know, we got to pursue this further. We got to find out where it takes us. If it was 10 or 15 or 20 ounces per ton, I might have walked away from it. If it was two or 300 ounces per ton, I might have considered walking away from it. But this is 7,500 times better than the best known deposit of the world. You know, we got to find out what this is all about. So, I went to this PhD analytical chemist that everybody said, if you can get this guy to do the work, he's the only certified expert witness in metallurgical separations in the, in the state of Arizona. Now this guy is the best you can buy. He's a PhD analytical chemist trained at Iowa State University, which is where the Department of Energy's metallurgical school is. So I went to this guy and I said, you know, here's the Soviet text. In here it says, this is how to do quantitative chemical separations. Would you run the procedure for me? And he looked over my book, he looked over the references. I told him about my spectroscopic studies and showed them references in the book. And he said, Dave, I've heard this story all of my life about these precious elements, particularly the platinum group here in Arizona. You must understand I'm a certified expert witness and the only thing I have to sell is my credentials. If I charge you money, then I have to write you reports. And he says, I'm not comfortable doing that. <laughs> so he said, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I will work for you at no charge at all until I can show you where you're wrong. And at that point, I'll sign a report and give it to you and you pay me then $60 an hour for my time. I was, gee, you know, 
Sounds fair enough to me. And so uh, I started working with this guy, and then he actually ran all the bureau standards, weights and measures procedures. He ran the, the Soviet procedures. He actually bought standards and ran them and the procedures. Anyway, three years later, <laughs> my bill was about $138,000. And he was kind of needing some money. <laughs> and he says, Dave, I can tell you it's not any of the other elements on the periodic table. <laughs> and, and I said, no, John, that's not enough. You've got to tell me what it is. And he says, well, when I put commercial standards in or run it through a procedure, it separates where it's supposed to separate. But when I put your stuff in run it through a procedure, it separates just like it's supposed to. Except, when I'm done, I've got six to eight ounces per ton of palladium, 12 to 13 ounces per ton of platinum, 150 ounces per ton of osmium, 250 ounces per ton of ruthenium, 600 ounces per ton of iridium, and 1,200 ounces per ton of rhodium. And I said, well, what's the problem? I mean, what, what, it says it was exactly the same numbers as spectroscopist was telling us from another laboratory. And he says, well, Dave, when we take an element that's so conspicuous, like rhodium, now, uh, uh, this, this lady over here has probably got the, this lady over here, this, this lady right here, you, would you stand up just so everybody see your, 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 your blouse? We got too many people in here, we're having difficulty getting up. See the color of this, this uh, sweatshirt she's wearing right here? That's the color of rhodium chloride solution. It's a very unusual color, thank you. <laughs> Rhodium got its name from the rose color of its chloride solution. It's a very unusual, very distinct color. It's a rose color. And so, you know, there's no other chemistry of anything other than possibly some shades of, of chromium are similar to this. But it's, it's, you know, it's a very unusual color. You don't find it anyplace else. And there was no chromium in our ore. So uh, anyway, he says, when I separate rhodium as pure rhodium, it looks just like that color. It's a gorgeous, you know, rose color. But when I neutralize the rhodium solution and it precipitates out of solution as a hydroxide, and I dry that at 850 degrees in a controlled atmosphere under oxygen, it forms an anhydrous dioxide. And it's red-brown, the very color it should be to be rhodium dioxide. And then I hydrogen reduce it, and the oxide leaves, and it's a gray-white powder, just like rhodium should be. But then I anneal it to 1,400 degrees, and it turns snow white. And he says, Dave, I have no idea what this white stuff is. <laughs> so I said, OK, well, let's, let's, what's the problem? And he says, well, at this point, in my formal education as a PhD chemist, I'm supposed to take these samples and send them for spectroscopic confirmation. And I said, well, it's pure rhodium. Let's send it for confirmation. He says, well, when I send the dioxide, they tell me it's iron. And he says, Dave, I know that this is not iron. You know, iron's a very common element. We work with it all the time. This is not iron. And I said, well, then what does what this material after you hydrogen reduce it read to be? And he says, well, it automatically quits being iron, and now it's silicon aluminum. <laughs> and I said, well, what's the white stuff? And he says, well, that's calcium and silica. So our iron that had no silica, no calcium, no aluminum, now becomes silica aluminum, and now there's no iron, just by putting hydrogen gas on it. And he says, Dave, my life was so simple before I met you. <laughs> now needless to say, this is taking years and years and years of work. Uh, I finally got involved with a Canadian partner who came in in 1986, and they put up some money and said, we will monitor the work you're doing, and when we're totally comfortable that what you're representing in fact is so, then we'll put up the money to build your, your production facility, which I wanted to build after the studies were done. And so I said, look, we're gonna use General Electric. General Electric actually has people back there who are building fuel cells out of rhodium and iridium. And they've actually bought rhodium and iridium to work with. They know the chemistries of it. So I said, we're going to take our stuff to them and have them do the evaluations of our rhodium and our iridium. 
and they says, good, we'll be your financial backer. We are backed by Legal and General Assurance in London, a 26 billion a year mutual fund. I says, okay, this, this looks like a real good arrangement. Everybody signed confidentiality agreements, nobody could talk about it, and we just did our studies. Well, when we got back to GE, I, I had talked with them, and they had told me, yeah, we did the fuel cells, and yeah, we know that the stuff doesn't analyze, and yeah, we know it explodes. I said, you've seen it? And they said, yeah, we've seen it, it explodes. I said, but it doesn't analyze. And they said, well, when we get our stuff from Johnson Matthey, our rhodium and our iridium, it doesn't work well in fuel cells, so we put it into molten salts. And when we do, it doesn't analyze nearly as well as when we bought it. They knew this. And they said, so your material you're saying doesn't analyze at all. We don't have a problem with this. <laughs> now keep in mind, these are people who build analytical instrumentation for a living, and they don't have a problem with it. I said, okay. So anyway, by the time we got our partners involved and got the stuff produced and got it back to them, they had sold their fuel cell division to United Technologies, and United Technologies had had the people come work for them for a few, few, few months, and then the people actually quit United Technologies and went and started their own, own uh, study group called Giener Incorporated in Waltham, Massachusetts. And so Tony LeConte went, to, went with them to the head of their fuel cell division at Giener Incorporated, and so by the time I get back with my material, they're at Giener Incorporated. So I said, well, great, now you can sign a confidentiality agreement where you won't talk to anyone about this and we'll work with you. So we paid them to do the fuel cell studies. As received, the, the rhodium we sent them, the alleged rhodium is what they referred to it, or the rhodium substitute, didn't have any rhodium in it. They sent it for analysis, no rhodium in there. Then they mounted it on carbon, and when they do that, it goes black and they put it into fuel cells and they tested the fuel cells for about three weeks. And then after they did the three weeks of testing, they tore down their fuel cell and sent the electrode back for analysis. And now it analyzes to have six to eight percent rhodium on it. The rhodium had mysteriously appeared from no place. Well, needless to say, they were very impressed because rhodium sells for a lot more than platinum. Rhodium is quite valuable. It's a lot more valuable than gold. And here we were getting it from no place. It was mysteriously appearing. <laughs> so they said, Dave, it's our opinion that nobody understands this. <laughs> Big revelation here, you know. <laughs> and I says, yeah. And they said, well, Dave, if you're the first one to discover it, if you're the first one to explain how to make it, then you can get a patent on this. And I said, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not interested in patenting this. This is not, I'm not interested in that. And they said, well, come talk to our patent attorney in Washington, D.C. So I went down to Washington, D.C., and I figured, well, I'll just give him an hour or two to talk to me. And one of the things this patent attorney told me, he said, Dave, if you don't tell the, anybody about this in a patent, if you elect to keep it proprietary and secret, then if somebody else discovers it and they file for a patent on it, they actually can stop you from working with it. Now that didn't sound right. <laughs> but he said, that's the law. So I said, well, gee, maybe I do want to patent it after all. So in uh, 1987, we filed US and worldwide patents on orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements, or what we call ORMS for short. And that was a name that we just were flying on an airplane trying to come up with a name, and I said, this guy was with me and he said, how about this? And I said, no. And he said, how about this? And he said, ORMS. And I said, yeah, that's, that sounds good. Orbitally rearranged monatomic elements, ORMS. So we had ORM gold, ORM platinum, ORM palladium, ORM silver, ORM uh, rhodium, ORM iridium, ORM ruthenium, ORM osmium. Anyway, uh, we filed those patents in 1987 and the patent office really objected to this. They said, Dave, in your patent, you're not being specific enough about the weights of this material. And I said, well, the weight isn't constant. If you produce this stuff as the pure gray-white powder and you take it out of the tube furnace where it hits the air, it says wait for two and a half minutes, then weigh it, and you wait two and a half minutes and it's still gaining weight. You wait for five minutes, it's still gaining weight. The scales are continuing to increase. And you wait for 15 minutes, it's still gaining weight. And I said, where do, you, where do you report the weight? What's the real weight of this stuff? 
you know, at what point you say, okay, this is it, this is the week. And uh, they said, well, we've got to have some precise numbers. You can't have estimates. You can't have approximates. And I said, well, it depends on how long you wait. And they said, well, get something where you don't ever have a variable. And so I said, well, that means we've got to be able to heat it and hydrogen reduce it and then weigh it and never have it get out in the air. And so I asked the, the PhD chemist, I said, is there any machine that would allow us to do this? And he says, well, yeah, the most specific one you can get is called thermogravimetric analysis. And I says, fine, get one of those machines. He says, well, about $380,000. And I says, on second thought, don't get one of the machines. <laughs> he says, but Dave, we can lease one for about 6000 a month. And I said, well, good. In two or three months, we can get all the studies done and we'll send it back. And he said, okay, we'll bring one in. So this is a machine that's all atmosphere controlled. It's computer operated. It's all atmosphere controlled. It has a micro balance where you actually can put the sample in on the balance and it weighs the sample while you oxidize it and hydrogen reduce it and anneal it all while you're weighing it. It never comes out of the atmosphere, the controlled atmosphere. It actually is weighing it in the heating apparatus. I said, well, that's, that's everything we need, right? So we bring this machine into town, we set it up, we start running this machine. So we oxidize it and it goes to 130%. We hydrogen reduce it and it goes to 103%. Everything so so far so good, and then we anneal away the hydrogen. It goes to fifty-six percent. I said, "Wait a minute, wait a minute." It was one hundred percent to start with. We went to one hundred and thirty percent. We oxidized one hundred and three percent. We hydrogen reduced it, and now it's fifty-six percent. Did we volatilize away part of the sample? Did it vaporize due to the high heat? So we took this fifty percent of this white powder and we put it over on a quartz boat. And we weighed the quartz boat, we weighed the powder, we put it all on the quartz boat, and we heated it up to like 15, 1600 degrees where it actually melted into the glass, the quartz. And when it melts into the glass, it turns black and all the weight comes back. So the mass never really left the sample. It just, when it was in there, you couldn't weigh it. This doesn't make any sense. I mean, this, this is not possible, right? So I said, well, let's do this again. Now let's oxidize it, let's hydrogen reduce it, and let's anneal it again, and let's turn it white. And sure enough, it went down to 56%. I said, well, let's cool it, and then heat it again, and cool it, and heat it again. Never take it out of, the, out of this machine. And so when we start weighing it as we're cooling it, the weight goes to 350, 400%, down to 56%, 200% down to 50%. It's jumping all over the place. I says, well, let's heat it again. So we, without ever taking it out of the machine, we start heating again. And the it starts going less, 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 and it goes like 20% of the weight. And then it will collapse back to 56%. So then we cool it down again. This time it goes 350, 400, 500%, and then collapse down to 56%, go up to huge amounts, then collapse down. And this was like over an hour and a half to two hours time. It's floating. And I says, well, let's heat it again. So then we just heat the same sample again. And this is all under a total inert gas. And it literally goes to the point it weighs less than the pan weighs it's sitting in. <laughs> in other words, if the powder wasn't in the pan, the pan would weigh zero. With the stuff in the pan, it weighs less than zero. And yet when you cool it back down, there the stuff is. It's never left. It's still 56% of the correct weight. But every time we heat it, it would go less than zero. And you know, when you look in there and look in the pan, it's not there. It's gone. The pan's empty. And yet when you cool it back down, it begins to form around the outside, and you see it solidify, and there it is again. We had no explanation for it, people. I mean, we were totally dumbfounded. 
So I went to the manufacturer of the machine, and, and they, they, by the way, they did give us magnetic standards that came with this machine. You can actually take a little salt crystal and put it in the machine, and you heat it, and at 250, 300 degrees, it would become magnetic. And then at like 650 or 700 degrees, it would lose the magnetism and go to a normal material. Then when you cool it back down at 650, it would become magnetic. 350, it would lose the magnetism. And it was actually a standard that you put in your machine to check it, see if it was, you know, interacting with the magnetic material. When we put the magnetic material in it, heat it and cool it, nothing happened. It weighed just perfectly. So it wasn't an interreaction of the field of the heating machine with the sample. And yet we put this stuff in it, it didn't make any sense at all. I mean, it was, it was crazy. It just any weight you wanted, it seemed to be able to be weighed that way. So I go off down to Varian over in, in the Bay Area in California who makes the machine, the Varian Corporation. And I said, look, look at this data here. It makes no sense at all. What's going on here with this machine? You know, it's got to be something you can explain, right? And they looked at it and they said, Dave, if you are cooling the sample, we'd say it's superconducting. But in as much as you're heating the sample, we have no idea whatsoever what's going on. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean by superconductivity? I mean, I, I don't know what superconductivity is. And they said, well, you know, it, it's literally a material that is so sensitive to magnetic fields. And I said, well, how sensitive? They said, well, a superconductor will respond to a magnetic field of 2 times 10 to the minus 15th ergs. I said, that's great. What's an erg? <laughs> they said, there's 10 to the 18th power ergs in a gauss. I said, what's a gauss? And they said, well, the Earth's magnetic field that a compass aligns with is about 0.56 gauss. So if a gauss is a, just a little bit more in the Earth's magnetic field, then an erg is 10 times 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 10. 18 times, there's that many ergs in a gauss. So an erg is a, is a little bitty, 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 about that big <laughs> amount of magnetic field. In other words, they talk about the charge around an electron, they talk about that in ergs. One electron. So that's a little bitty tiny measure of magnetic field. Okay? A superconductor responds to 2 times 10 to the minus 15th ergs. Or 0 0.00000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
So I actually got a bunch of books over in England and I started to read about superconductivity. And this is really important, people, to understand because this is the basis of everything. I think it was what Ramtha says, you call this superconductivity? Okay. <laughs> All right, I actually took this white powder and I put it on the table and I get a voltmeter. Now, a voltmeter has two electrodes and you hook it up on a piece of wire and you turn on the battery pack. It's actually a battery powered machine and it measures the conductivity on the wire between these two electrodes. So I take this little instrument, I set it on my powder and I put it at both ends of the powder and I turn this battery pack on and I figured, this is just gonna be like touching these electrodes together. It's gonna be dead short, right? Because it's a superconductor, right? So I put it on, turn it on, nothing happens. I said, well, this isn't a perfect conductor. This is, this is a perfect insulator. <laughs> uh, nothing flows at all. And then I get to the second chapter in the book. <laughs> and I find out that a superconductor, by definition, is not a perfect conductor. A superconductor is a material that does not allow any external magnetic field to exist in the sample. Okay, no external magnetic field can exist in a superconductor when it's superconducting. So my battery pack actually has electricity in it and it requires a voltage potential to get the electron off the wire and into the sample. And it takes a voltage potential to get the electricity out of the sample and into the wire. But by definition, the sample, if it's a superconductor, doesn't allow any voltage potential to exist in it. So there's no way to get the electricity off this wire and in that sample. So that means it's absolutely worthless. <laughs> well, then I got to chapter three. <laughs> and then it says that everywhere in the superconductor, it's like a laser. There is a single frequency light in the superconductor. So everywhere in the superconductor, it is single frequency of light, all one frequency. And what it said is you have to resonance frequency tune the vibrating electron on the metal to agree with the frequency of the superconductor. And when you have it tuned to its exact correct match with the superconductor, then the electrons will pair up and go on as electron pairs in the superconductor with no push at all. Because they're always moving on the wire continually anyway, not really going anyplace. But when you give them a superconductor and resonance frequency tune them, they literally go on to the superconductor because they're seeking the path of least resistance. And that's in the superconductor. So all these electrons, the spin one half electron and the spin one half time reversed electron, now become spin one boson and go on as light. Now it's real important to understand. The spin one half electron and the time reverse spin one half electron pair together and form a spin one boson and they lose all particle aspect. So this particle plus this particle is no particle. It's physics, don't ask me, it's just physics. So one half plus one half is one and that has no halves. <laughs> anyway, it's just light. Now the really strange thing here is an electron exists in space-time and another electron exists in space-time and these two electrons can't cohabitate, they won't get together. They exist in space-time, they won't occupy the same space-time. But when they pair up, then they lose all particle aspect and millions of phonons can exist in the same space-time. Isn't that weird? <laughs> I mean, gosh, what's going on here? So what happens, as long as you have the wire resonance frequency tuned to the vibrational frequency of the superconductor, and you have it attached to a source of electrons like the Earth, drive a stop on the ground, hook the wire up to it, they literally go on forever. And ever, and ever, just keep going on. And they don't have to come off. They just go on, go on, keep going in there, just keep going and... Now you say, okay, how do I know they're in there? <laughs> There's no way to measure them when they're in there. All your instruments are based on deflection or differential. 
but there's no way you can measure differential because there is no differential. There's no voltage. A perfect superconductor can flow up to 200,000 volt, uh, 200,000 amps with no potential. 200,000 amps per square foot with no potential. So you can actually put the superconductor up, flow in 200,000 amps per square foot, and hold it against your cheek, and there's no tingle, there's no tickle, there's no sparks, nothing, because there's no volts. Okay, it's just light, like liquid light flowing. Now the other thing you need to understand is the light does not flow at the speed of light. The light actually flows at the speed of sound, which is very important. It flows within the superconductor at the speed of sound. So you actually can kind of see it move. You know, it's just kind of, kind of like liquid light flowing in there. So how do you know what's in there? Well, what you do is you read the amount of magnetic field that's being produced around the sample. So now we're at another thing we got to learn. A superconductor, when it is flowing current inside the superconductor, forms around it a, ma a magnetic field, just like a wire when it's flowing current forms around it a magnetic field. Except this magnetic field isn't formed by electrons, it's formed by electron pairs or light. So the field it produces is not a positive field or a negative field, it's a zero field or a null field. It has no north or south pole. So the field it produces repulses north poles and it repulses south poles. It's a null field. So as the current's going into it, or the amperage, literally the field gets larger and larger and larger and larger and larger. But it's a null field. And so it repulses all external magnetic fields. So whether you have a north pole or a south pole or you have voltage potential or whatever you have, it will not penetrate the sample. It won't get in the sample. It hits it and is deflected around it. If you get a high enough field, it actually feeds into the superconductor. It eats the field. If you get a high enough field, it actually pulls that energy into the superconductor and flows more light from the field. So this isn't at all like electricity. Electricity resists the field. This, if you put a field to it, it eats the field. Wow. This is really strange. So how do you get the current out of a superconductor? You have to hook the wire up to the superconductor and then you have to resonance frequency tune the vibrating frequency of the wire to match the vibrating frequency of the superconductor and then apply a voltage and out come the electron pairs and they become electrons and now they're in the wire going on down the road. But the neat thing about this is you can put electricity in this in Seattle and run the superconductor all the way to New York City and you put the energy on in Seattle and you can wait for two months and go to, go to New York City and take it out and it's all there. It's a quantal phenomenon that runs forever and ever and ever. You can actually approach a superconductor with a magnetic field and it starts superconducting in response to the field. It takes the magnetic field into the superconductor as electron pairs and flows light in response to the field. Well, literally the Earth's magnetic field is a tremendous magnetic field for a superconductor. It's 0.56 gauss, which gosh, that's a long ways from 2 times 10 to the minus 15th ergs. Right? That's a monster field. So literally it begins to superconduct in response to the Earth's magnetic field. And it's flowing so much current inside of it that it levitates on the Earth's magnetic field. It cannot be weighed. It won't drop down because the Earth's magnetic field goes around it and holds it in the field. So it really floats. So in 1988, we filed U.S. and worldwide patents on ORMS in March of 88, ORMS, and that was a refiling, ORMS, Orbitally Rearranged Monatomic Elements, and S-ORMS, the mini-atom system of superconducting ORMS. So we had all these patents on ORMS, all these elements, and we had another series of patents on S-ORMS, the mini-atom system of resonance-coupled atoms. 
And when you understand that a superconductor will not let any magnetic field in the sample, it reflects all light, what color does it have to be? White. All light's reflected, so it has to be white. Or invisible, so, well, it was quite close. So anyway, uh, uh, we got this filed in March of 88, and I didn't realize that any patent on superconductivity requires approval of the Department of Defense. They forgot to tell me that part. Anyway, we go rolling along nice and comfortable. You got a year's grace here from the US Patent Office that if you file your patent worldwide within a year, everything's gonna be rosy. So come three weeks before the end of our year, we notify them we're gonna file our worldwide patent. Well, before they answered, somebody went back and reread the patent. They realized it was superconductivity. Nobody picked up on this. I said it has hoofs, it has horns, it goes moo, it gives milk, and it has baby calves, but I never call it a cow. <laughs> so anyway, when they went back and read it, they said, uh-oh, off to Department of Defense it goes. Department of Defense comes back and says, you cannot file this worldwide, it's strategic importance to this country. And we said, wait a minute, wait a minute. By law, I have to be given a six month appeal period. You've only got three weeks. By this time, Pons and Fleischmann had filed all their information on cold fusion, which if you know this, you now know what cold fusion is. I said, no, 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 we've got to have this date. So the patent office says, okay, go ahead and file it worldwide, we'll override the Department of Defense. So in March of 88, we filed US and worldwide patents worldwide in every country but China and the Soviet Union. Well, needless to say, my name was Mud at the Department of Defense. So they said, well, if we can't prevent him from filing this patent, we're gonna learn everything he knows. And so I get this phone call from this man who says, Dave, I wanna invest in your technology. I said, how do you know anything about my technology? Well, he says, well, I know you're doing this, now you're doing this. And he's telling me things specifically out of my patent. And nobody's supposed to ever seen this patent. You know, the, the, the patent review board's supposed to have seen it. And the Department of Defense review board's supposed to have seen it. But nobody in the military should know about this. And yet this man's quoting me verbatim from my patent. So I hired a private investigator to check him out, find out who he is. <laughs> Come to find out, he flies out of Langley Air Force Base. And what happened is when the, when, when the military went to Congress to get approval of funds for Star Wars, Congress turned them down. And so what they did is they took a bunch of covert money and they put it over in Swiss bank accounts and this man takes that money and goes to companies who have technologies that serve the Department of Defense interest and he invests money in them. And then you have a partner at the Department of Defense. And so I said, no, no, I don't think we need your help. And he said, Dave, you will never prove this without us. You will wait two, three years before you can ever get your, your, your material on the neutron deflection studies, which are the absolute proof of superconductivity. A superconductor repulses all external magnetic fields, including the spin charge of a neutron. A neutron has no polarity, but it does have a spin charge. And a, and a superconductor is the only thing that literally will deflect the spin charge of a neutron. So anything that's superconducting cannot be seen with neutron activation. I said, well, I already know that. I don't need that analysis. Anyway, he was back two or three times and after that he just dropped it and left. He never came back. We just continued along our merry way doing our research. In 1989, I called for my Canadian partners to come up with the money to build a plant. They had 22 other investments other than me, and all of their other investments had, been, had gone sour. And their credibility with Legal and General Assurance was being questioned by Legal and General. They said, do you really know what you're doing? And so they came to me and said, Dave, we want to tell Legal and General about the work you're doing. I says, you can't, you sign confidentiality agreements. In fact, the president of Legal and General Assurance's 
venture capital firm set on, the, on my board of directors in Phoenix. His name was Peter Simon. He actually sat there on my board, but he was in a confidentiality agreement. Couldn't talk about it. So what they finally did is they said, Dave, we really need to do this. How about if we all have the guy doing the evalu evaluation agree to sign a confidentiality agreement too, and then we have the evaluation done, and then you decide whether to let it be released or not. So in 1989, Brian Lurwell, who was Precious Metal Consultancy over in England, was engaged by Legal and General Assurance to come into Canada and the US and evaluate my technology. He spent 10 days, he saw everything. He saw the geological studies, the core drilling, the mapping. He saw the chemical studies and all the separations we were doing. He saw them in Canada and in Phoenix. He went to GE, saw the, the fuel cell studies, the record keeping, the work going on there. He went to the patent office, reviewed the patents. He discussed with me personally everything about it. And he says, Dave, this is just unbelievable. It explains everything that we don't understand in the industry. So when he got his report all written, he sent us a copy back for our review, and we took it before our board of directors. Well, Bill Estes of Estes Homes in Phoenix was actually on my board of directors. In 1989, we were in a tr really severe real estate slump in Arizona. And Bill Estes was kind of having some financial problems. Bill was also a small investor. And Bill said, Dave, if we release this report to a $26 billion a year mutual fund, they could put up so much money, I could not match it with the amount of money I would need to come up with. And so I'm refusing to let it be released. So Legal and General Assurance paid for one of the top men in the world to evaluate our technology in 1989. I have a copy of his written report, and Legal and General never got to see it. So needless to say, Legal and General disappeared. They said, we're not funding anymore. You know, we paid for this report, never got to see it. So you know, everything's off, no more money. So in 1990 through 1993, I had to litigate with my Canadian partners to get this company back that I had given them to get them involved. They didn't contest the litigation, but it took three years to go through the court processes before I finally got the judgment back. And it was, in fact, in 1994 that I, I could first talk about this. I want you people to know that this knowledge of this material is something that you just couldn't talk about in your own community. If I go to people in the, the farming community where I live and I mention anything about this to them, they say, uh, Dave, I really have to be someplace. Uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but I really have to run. We'll talk about it another time. And they're gone, just like that, gone. It was, it was in 1994 that this fellow at, at uh, a place called Global Sciences, he invited me and he says, Dave, we'd like for you to come back and talk to us. And that's where I went. And for, I actually came and talked to a group of about 200 people. And these people totally understood what I was saying. And it just blew my mind that there was 200 people who could understand this. Uh, I really, in 1991-92, was handed a book from my uncle on alchemy. And he says, Dave, you need to read this book. And I said, no, I don't. I said, that's about alchemy, and I'm not interested in the occult. And he says, well, well you know, this is when the church was involved in it. It got all messed up with philosophy and everything. And I said, no, I'm not interested in that. And he said, well, Dave, you ought to read it because it talks about a white powder of gold. And I says, what? And he says, he says, yeah, it talks about a white powder of gold. Well, one of the things we had done with this is when you understand that this is like a stealth atom, that the atom can be there, but it doesn't identify by any instrumental analysis. It's like a stealth plane. You know, the stealth plane flies by, and you look up, you see it fly by, and yet the radar machine says there's nothing up there. So it's really there, but the machine just can't see it. Well, this machine, this, this, these metals are really there. The machine just can't see them. And so in 1991, uh, I, I, I said, all right, hand me the book, and I began to read it. And it talks about a gold glass. Well, 1160 degrees, the white powder of gold fuses to a gold glass under vacuum. It's clear as window glass. And here's talk about gold glass. I said, you know, is there any chance 
that this white powder of gold could be the white powder of gold? Then I start reading information about this. And one of the things I found in the Hebrew writings is that the name for the golden tree of life is O-R means gold of the highest light. O-R-M-E-S or O-R-M-U-Z is the golden tree. And then I found out in the book of Isaiah, it says a latter-day David is the one who's to plant the golden tree of life that brings about the thousand years of no disease or illnesses. And, you know, I just begin to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, something's going on here. <laughs> and so, you know, we begin to understand that there's a whole lot more than just a new discovery of materials. It, in fact, is another form of matter, and it has implications that relate to nature and, in fact, many things other than high technology. There is one other thing that I wanted to tell you about superconductivity that, in fact, I forgot to tell you, in as much as I now know that you know about quantum coherence. There is, there is an aspect of superconductivity that is very much different than electricity in addition to things I've already shared with you. In fact, when the Meissner field grows around a superconductor, two superconductors can actually sit at distance from each other. They don't have to touch. As long as the Meissner fields touch, the energy between the two superconductors can actually act as one. Now it's real important. See, electricity when it has to touch before electricity can flow. If you separate the contacts, it can't flow. Superconductors can actually sit at distance from each other and literally if the fields touch, the electricity as light flows back and forth between the two as one. Okay, this is what they call quantum coherence. So even though the atom's over here and another atom's over here, if in fact they are in resonance with each other and their Meissner fields touch, then they're as if they're one. And that's not something we're used to thinking that way. We assume everything has to be closed for there to be electrical conductivity. This isn't electrical conductivity. This is superconductivity. Okay. Uh, we're going to go through this pretty fast this time because we've already gone through it once. Uh, but I think that I think this sequence is explanatory and helps helps everybody with it. And I think we've got two screens. Yeah. Okay. This this article is from Scientific American. It's called Microclusters. If we could raise it up and read the reference, so everybody's got that. It's Scientific American, December 1989. Scientific American, and it says. Small aggregates of atoms constitute a distinct phase of matter. Their chemistry at once highly reactive and selective has possible applications in catalysis, optics, and electronics. Divide and subdivide a solid and the traits of its solidity fade away one by one like the features of the Cheshire Cat to be replaced by characteristics that are not those of liquids or gases. They belong instead to a new phase of matter, the microcluster. Microclusters consist of tiny aggregates comprising from two, and that's the key, two, which we're talking about clusters, two to several hundred atoms. They pose questions that lie at the heart of solid state physics and chemistry and the related field of material science. How small must an aggregate of particles become before the character of the substance they once formed is lost? And how might the atoms reconfigure themselves if freed from the influence of matter that surrounds them? Now this is the key sentence here, people. How might the atoms reconfigure themselves if freed from the influence of the matter that surrounds them? Now most of us were taught that an atom is an atom. And if it's in a metal, it has nearest neighbors, and if it's by itself, it's naked. But it still is the atom. Well, in fact, that isn't true. There are atoms that when you free them from the nearest neighbors, they actually reconfigure themselves. They change their nature. They are not the same atom they were before. Okay, let's go to the next slide. This is a reference from, from solid state physics and the liquid state uh, by the Xerox Re Research Facility. And this actually talks about nonmetals, the glass transition. It says, a prerequisite for glass formation is the prevention of nucleation and crystal growth as the liquid is cooled below, it, below its melting or freezing point. So a prerequisite for a glass to form is that it not develop any crystalline structure with itself. The atoms not rearrange themselves. 
So that's the reason when you get to the monoatomic state, it totally does not look like a metal anymore. This white powder looks like baking flour. Okay, it looks like cooking flour. It's snow white, very talky, and doesn't at all look like it's a metal. Let's go to the next reference. This is from the same, the same book, and what they're talking about is their splat cooling metals. And if you melt a metal, a metal goes totally amorphous, and then you slam that molten metal against a super cool plate, and you take the energy out of it so fast that it doesn't have time to crystallize. And if you can actually get the energy in the metal below its crystallization point, then it can't crystallize anymore. You've got it below that, that energy that it takes to crystallize. Now it's in a glassy state. Anyway, the sentence in here that's really important is as the temperature decreases below the melting temperature, the critical radius also decreases, and at the temperature equal to the melting temperature, the critical radius goes to infinity. In other words, you melt it, it's just totally amorphous. It has no structure at all. But the next sentence is the key. In the range of temperatures where potential nuclei actually grow, the critical radius is usually about 10 atomic diameters. So here's a reference for it right here in a published text. If you have 10 atomic diameters or larger, it will aggregate to itself and grow metal. If the atoms are in 10 atomic diameters or less, they repulse each other. They will not come together and you don't get metal. Now that, that's just a general number, the 10. In fact, when you find out that for iridium, for instance, it's nine atom clusters, Anything larger than nine grows. Anything less than nine comes apart. For platinum and rhodium, it's five atom clusters. Anything five or larger comes together. Anything five or less then comes apart. For gold, it's diatomic. Diatomic or larger is metallic and grows. If it's monoatomic, it doesn't grow. So as you can see, gold's the toughest one. It's, it's, the, it's the one that fights you all the way down to the monoatomic state. It doesn't help you one bit. No slack granite here. Iridium, all you gotta do is get it below nine and just heat it and cool it, heat it and cool it, and it comes apart all on its own. Okay? Now it's real interesting. When the man from Engelhardt Industry evaluated our work, he said, gosh, this explains so many things we can't understand. At in, in Englehart, when we actually bring iridium scrap back to our factory from the jewelry industry and we try re-refining the iridium, we cannot guarantee over an 86% recovery on the iridium. 14% is lost in the processing. Yet when we get gold, we can get 99.9% .9 recovery on it. Well, the reason is you will never disaggregate gold to the monoatomic state in any normal processing. And so it always recovers 100%. But iridium, when you get below 9 atom clusters, it comes all apart. And so in the dissolution of the iridium, much of it does happen to get below 9 atom clusters. And so they lose 14%. And he says, gosh, that explains why we can't process iridium well. Why platinum and rhodium, we get about 97% recovery. And with gold, we get 100% virtually. And that's why. It isn't lost in the processing. So what they're doing is they're dumping 14% of the iridium down the drain. They don't know where it went. It's still in solution, won't come back. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Then one other reference that I think is real important and for those people interested in the, in the physics, we're gonna get right down to the bottom of it. The last sentence here. For many molecular and polymeric glasses, the glass transition temperature less absolute zero temperature is only about 40 to 60 degrees Kelvin. So in other words, absolute zero, no temperature at all. There's only about 40 degrees Kelvin between absolute zero and the temperature of the glass. So what they're saying is the glass is cold. That the internal temperature of the glass is very, very cold. And you don't have to take that much temperature out of it before it's absolute zero. Okay? It's real important to understand that, that the internal temperature of the atom has nothing to do with the outside temperature. That even though it's sitting here at room temperature, 350 or 360 degrees Kelvin, that has nothing to do with the internal temperature of the atom. The atom is totally a world all its own. Let's go to the last slide here.
And here, here is a reference when you understand that in fact in a metal the temperature depending on the metal is somewhere between 350 and 375 degrees Kelvin. It's pretty darn hot in a metal. When you disaggregate the metal to smaller and smaller cluster size, in fact you are lowering the internal bound temperature of the system. There actually are researchers over in Italy who actually measure the phonon frequency of energy being shared between the nucleus and the electrons and they find that that wavelength gets longer and longer and longer the smaller and smaller the particle size becomes. And actually they, they actually here are specific examples. Here is potassium which is K2 diatomic potassium and its internal temperature is about 90 to 100 degrees at the 10, at 10 uh, millibars pressure. But at one millibar pressure, it's about 110 degrees. The trimer of sodium is about 100 degrees, and the dimer of sodium is about, what, 10, 20, 30, 40, about 40, 50 degrees. So as you can see, the trimer is hotter than the dimer. It's from there to there. Well, they can't find the monomer, but it should be somewhere down in here approaching absolute zero, but they can't find it to measure it. They don't know how to, how to see it. They try to find it and they can't find it. Well, the problem is they really can't produce it readily. Okay, so as you, as you disaggregate the metal by chemistry, you're actually cooling the metal down. Okay, this is an article out of uh, Scientific American, March 1990. It's called New Radioactivities. Now, I'm going to say this again, like I said before, I'm not trying to teach you nuclear physics, people. What I want you to see is the date. I want you to see who published it. I want you to see the credentials. And we will read a few excerpts out of it. But I'm not trying to teach you nuclear physics because this isn't what this is about. This is about seeing as a confirmation of when we filed our patent and what's going on. This article called New Radioactivities is all about studying the nucleus. And here they have these harmonic sequences of protons and neutrons depicted like a, kind of like a bullseye. Well, they, f they found out that the, the protons and neutrons fill in the nucleus just like the electrons fill. You remember the electron orbitals they taught you in chemistry class? There's 2, 8, 8, 16. There's actually harmonic sequences. It, it goes 1, 2, and then that one's filled, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, then that one's filled, and then start the next one. Well, the nucleus fills in the same way. The protons and neutrons are actually quantum oscillators and they fill in harmonic sequences. So they fill, same note, octave higher, same note, octave higher. They fill in harmonic sequences. And they depict these here as, as, as little rings. So you got it here, you got it here, you got it here. They just fill is coming out. Okay? That's what this is depicting, is proton and neutron configuration. Let's go to the next slide. Now this is the left-hand side of the page. This other page is the right-hand side. And here, what we're depicting is the uranium-232, its proton and neutron orbitals begin to deform. Then it becomes severely deformed, and then it pops apart into neon-24 and lead-208, two different elements. Now when this was first observed by the nuclear physicists who are capable of working with a single atom, there was no alpha, no beta, and no gamma emission. And this was not the nuclear physics they expected to see. Anytime you get fission, there is also always alpha, beta, or gamma emission. One, sometimes a combination. But when this happened, there was no alpha, beta, or gamma emission. And the nuclear physicist said, whoa, what happened here? It was uranium-232, now, now it's lead and, and uh, neon. Where'd it come from? How'd it happen? This isn't the way it's supposed to be. So anyway, what we need to read here is, is basically, this is really critical to this whole understanding, is this basic information here. It is now known that the atomic nucleus is a more or less spherical object whose diameter is about a few Fermi's, or a unit of measure equal to one quadrillionth of a meter, or simply 10 to the minus 15th meters. In other words, it's very, 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 very tiny. <laughs> For comparison, the radius of the moon's orbit is only about 30 times greater than the diameter of the Earth. So what they're trying to show you is, you know, here's the Earth and here's the moon, 
and here's the itty bitty tiny nucleus and a huge electron cloud around it. It's nowhere near the size of this nucleus. The electron cloud's immense compared to the size of this tiny little nucleus. It says, packed in this Fermi-sized nucleus is nearly all the mass of an atom and all of its positive electric charge. The mass of the nucleus comes mainly from nucleons and protons carry the positive charge. Okay, no big deal. It's what we were taught in school. The structure of the nucleus arises from two types of inner reactions, the strong and the electromagnetic. And as a result of the strong inner reaction of the nuclear force, protons bind to neutrons and to each other. So this is the glue, the strong force, the glue. The nuclear force binds nucleons very tightly but acts over a very short range. To separate two neutrons that are one Fermi apart, for instance, requires an energy of about one million electron volts. Now everything so far is exactly the way we were taught in school. No problems, everything just the way we were taught. But it says, on the other hand, only about 10 electron volts is needed to disassociate two nucleons that are 10 Fermis apart. Now this is where the situation changes people. It only takes 10 electron volts to cause these nuclear particles to come apart if they're deformed. Now, as a result of the electromagnetic interreaction or the Coulomb force, protons repel other protons. Although the Coulomb force is weaker than the nuclear force, it acts over a much longer range. So if two protons are one Fermi apart, the Coulomb force is about 100 times weaker than the nuclear force. Yet at a distance of 10 Fermis, the Coulomb force is about 10 times stronger than the nuclear force. So what this is saying is that little weak force isn't very strong, the one that tries to push the nucleus apart, until it gets a little bit deformed. And when it gets the least little bit deformed, the glue quits working. And then the force that's trying to push them apart blows them apart. It didn't say it needed any help at all. It says it blows itself apart. Now this isn't the world we were taught in school. The nucleus is supposed to be a very stable thing. It takes millions of electron volts to rip it apart, and here we're talking about one coming apart all on its own. Sounds like alchemy. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next one. Anyway, that's the basis of what we're talking about, people. Now, here's the periodic table. Now, this is the Mendeleev periodic table, the standard chemistry periodic table. And basically what it says is over here, these nuclei are very stable. And what it says over here is these nuclei are very stable. What they first found is starting here with actinium, number 89, right here, number 89. Then it goes 90, 91, 92, 93, 94. These are all the heavy elements called the actinide group named after actinium. These are the heavy ones. And these nuclear physicists found that every one of these elements Actinium, thorium, protractium, uranium, neptunium, plutonium, and americinium, every one of these would just deform and blow apart if they were monoatomic. They say, well, why didn't they discover this sooner? Well, nobody ever looked at it that well before. They found out they just come apart. They actually become deformed just like their radioactive isotope come apart. Well, most of these are radioactive isotopes. So you say, well, it's no big deal then, Dave. They're just coming apart, but this is what we'd expect. There's no big deal. But no sooner did they find that the actinide group here would do it, all these heavy elements, then they began to look at the lanthanide group, which is number 57. And they found that 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 60, if you move them up and stick them in the periodic table, they should go right here. Okay, that's where they should be. But they took them out, they moved them down here, and then they shoved the next row up. So it's kind of missing out of the periodic table because they're called the rare earths. And they say, you're never going to find these that much. You don't have to worry. That's why you don't need to worry about this. They're just the rare earths. Well, they're not that rare. They found out since then they're not that rare. But anyway, when they began to look at this group of elements, they found that when they began with the lanthanide group, the beginning here was 62, samarium, europium, gadolinium, terbium, and dysprosium. So 62 through 66, this group right here all would do this. They literally deform and blow themselves apart. 
all on their own. Or they're capable of blowing themselves apart, but they deform. And they say, well, golly, 62 through 66, those are not that heavy an element. They're right here in the middle of the periodic table, and they blow apart. And so they said, gee, if this will do it, and it's based on the harmonic sequence in the nucleus, that over here the nucleus are, are just starting to fill their outer orbitals, and here they're just completing filling the, their, their outer orbitals, but it's these elements right here in the center of the periodic table where the problem is, because they have half-filled or half-empty nuclear orbitals. So they are the most unfilled or the most out of balance that any system could be. It's like having a big glob of mud on one of the tires in your car. It just goes, home, go home, go home, as you try to drive it down the road. You gotta get out and wash that mud off because it'll just deform itself. It'll shake the tire off your car. Anyway, if you take this group, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, and you move it up and you stick it in the periodic table right here where it belongs, it goes 58, 59, 60, 61, 62. So here's where 62 should be, 63, 64, 65, and 66. So they said, well, gee, if these elements do that, then these elements here, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, silver, and cadmium, and osmium, iridium, platinum, gold, and mercury should also do the same thing. That's the thinking, okay? If the, if the rare earths do it, then the ones immediately below and immediately below, below it should also do the same thing. That's the theory. So let's go to the next paper. Now remember, if this is boring, this is the science. <laughs> okay, this is uh, 1989, the American Physical Society. I think the reference on here, yeah, this is volume 39, number three, Physical Review C, March 1989. Possible discontinuity in octopole, octopole behavior in the platinum through mercury region. Now that coincidentally is the platinum, gold, and mercury. It's the platinum through mercury. Why they just don't use the word gold, I still haven't figured out, but. Anyway, this is a theory put out by the Department of Nuclear Physics Research School of Physical Sciences, Australian National University. It was, it was actually received October 88, published in March of 89. What they, this is, this is a theory about the way the protons and neutrons interact with each other. It's real complex physics. We don't understand it. We don't care to understand it. There may be a few physicists that are interested in understanding. It's far over my head. But they do say a few things that are very important. It says, apart from the well-deformed rare earth and heavy actinide nuclei, which is what I just told you, the actinide nuclei and the well deformed rare earths, okay, which is confirming what I just told you, which would not be expected to agree with this theory, to conform to this parameterization, they found that nuclei in the platinum region with proton number 78 through 82 and neutron number 108 to 126 were also anomalous. In other words, they don't work either. They become deformed. But right here is the key sentence. A discontinuity of this magnitude is not observed in any other part of the periodic table. In other words, this is as bad as it gets. <laughs> Platinum, gold, and mercury. As bad as it gets. People ask me, well, how deformed is it? Gold just happens to be 2.6 to 1 deformation. That's the number, 2.6 to 1. You can figure out what the symbolism of that is and what it means. Anyway, let's go to the next one. Uh, I think it's on the top on these, yeah. Physical Review C, volume 37, number two, February 1988. Now this is the one exception. I filed my patent, or refile was in March of 88 when they actually recorded the date. This is one month earlier. All my other references are after my patent. This one's one month before. Collective and single particle structure in rhodium 103. People, you don't know this, but most of you don't, but rhodium-103 is the only stable isotope of rhodium. It's just like gold, it only has one stable isotope. But they're talking about high spin states, and that rhodium is a soft nucleus and exhibits shape coexistence. In other words, it's not stable, it just deforms like putty. What they're talking about is, the, is where they find this, how many nucleides, and the onset of deformation when neutrons are equal to 60, and then the most important sentence is here. 
In part, this is reflected in the level structure of proton numbers equal to or greater than 42, neutron numbers equal or greater than 56, nuclei such as ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, and silver isotopes, which just happen to be the elements in my, my patent application. Okay? All right, uh, let's go to the next one. Physical Review C, volume 38, number 2, August 88. Os structure of osmium and platinum isotopes. And what they're talking about here is the change in shape, that the shapes went from prolate to the asymmetric parameter, and they, they go to oblate with the, the, then they're talking about the frequency number and the, the bands. Anyway, this is all about the change in shape of the nucleus and how deformed they become and what shape they take. It's real interesting physics. It's not very good reading, so we're not going to read any further than this. For physicists who want to read it, that's the confirmation it deforms badly. But this one now is real specific, people. Physical Review C, Volume 38, Number 2, August 1988, from Rapid Communications. Super deformation in Palladium 104 and 105. This is a neat thing. Whenever you discover something, you get to name it. You get to put a name on it, anything you like. So now we got superconductivity. Now they're talking about super deformed. Okay, that's what they're talking about. This is the Nuclear Science Division, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories, Berkeley, California. This is United States Government National Laboratories. If this isn't good enough for you, no credentials will be. What they're saying here, of special interest, are those shapes known as super deformed, SD, where the nucleus acquires a very elongated shape that can be approximately represented by an ellipsoid, where the ratio of the long to short axis is considerably larger than that of a normal deformation of 1.3 to 1. So in other words, the normal deformation is about 1.3, just slightly egg-shaped. But, it says, uh, one can expect the existence of favorable shell gaps that appear regularly as a function of deformation and nucleon number. And anyway, they correspond to ratios of the length of the axis of about two to one. Okay, so what they're saying is the word super deformed actually is the word they give to it when it's twice as long as it is wide, two to one. And when it becomes two to one, it spin flips to the high spin state. Okay? Twice as long as it is wide, it spin flips to the high spin state. And then they're talking about the discovery of it 15 years. They, they first discovered it had to wait 15 years until they found that it was in the actinide group and the rare earths. And they're talking about single particle configuration, pairing correlations, or population decay mechanisms. Anyway, nuclei at high spin and large deformation. Very good paper, very excellent paper if you want to read about these atoms and what happens to them and what, why they go to high spin and why the deformation occurs and how the nucleons interact with themselves. Anyway, that's pretty heavy physics. I don't care to know. Key words, super deformed, high spin. Now, what's the next reference? Now, what happens to the atom when it goes to the high spin state? When you understand that around a normal atom, a normal atom has around it what's called the screening potential. It's the positive screening potential produced by the nucleus. And all of the electrons going around this nucleus are under the screening potential except for the valence electrons, those outermost most electrons. So the, the screening potential produces a positive screening potential around the nucleus. All of the electrons are hidden under this except for the valence electrons, okay? What happens when the nucleus goes to the high spin state, the positive screening potential expands out and now covers all of the electrons under the, the, the nucleus's control. So all of your valence electrons are now screened by the nucleus. Now a real unusual thing happens when this occurs. What you have in electrons is they run around the nucleus in pairs. You have a spin forward electron and a spin reverse electron and a spin forward electron and a spin reverse electron. When these are under the positive screening potential of a high spin nucleus, all of your time forward electrons become correlated and, and with the time reverse electron. And a strange thing happens to this time reversed electron. 
the time-reversed electron now acts like a positron. Now this is important, and you physicists don't hit me until you hear this on out. A positron, by definition, comes from the nucleus. It's a charge that comes off a proton. But under the screening potential of the nucleus, the time-reversed electron acts just like a positron, or the mirror image of an electron. That's only happens in our high-spin atom. So now your time-forward electron and your time-reversed electron, which now acts like a positron, becomes perfectly correlated and literally goes to light. Okay? So now instead of a nucleus with all these individual electrons flying around it, we actually have a nucleus with a bundle of light all around it. Okay, new concept now. A bundle of light, liquid light, flowing at the speed of sound. But then this isn't regular light. This is another kind of light. Yeah, it's a phonon wave running around the nucleus traveling at the speed of sound. Okay, now, what happens? Remember we were talking earlier about the Coulomb force, which was the repulsive force, and the nuclear force, which is a strong force? And what happens is the Coulomb force now is, overcomes the attractive force when it's in the high spin state, and the nucleus is trying to come apart? Well, what happens is, when the Coulomb force now is a residuum wave that comes off of this high spin atom, it didn't used to be there, but now it's coming off of it. It actually emanates this Coulomb or repulsive wave. Now, it wasn't there before in the low spin state, but now it's there in the high spin state. And so the atoms won't get very close together. You put this stuff together and you put it in a press, you say, by golly, I'm going to force this stuff together. I'm going to make it go together. And it won't ever go together. It will not reform metal. Okay? Well, how far apart do the atoms get? And where do they repulse? How far apart do they space themselves? Well, it just so happens, these people in doing research, somebody's already done it. If you just dig enough in the literature, you find somebody's already done it. What they did, and this, this, this is from volume 62, number 10, Physical Review Letters, March 6, 1989. Let's raise it up here and see our chart. Okay, right here. These guys were working with metallurgy, and they actually, you got to understand in metallurgy, there's interreaction energy between the atoms in million electron volts, and here you got the one dimension, two dimensions, and three dimensions. Now, this is the way the metallurgists describe their interreaction in, in, graphically, like this. So here's one, two, and three interreaction. Here are the repulsive energies. All these light colored bars right here are all the repulsive energies. Here's the attractive energy. Now that's the longest one we got. A tremendous attraction right here. And then there's another repulsive energy right here. Another attraction right here. And then it kind of settles down. So what they found is the alternation between repulsion and attraction as the orientation of the atom pair on the surface has changed. So there actually is repulsion, attraction, repulsion, attraction. And then it settles down. And they say it's like a Coulomb wave is coming off the atom. Now they only see this when they went to these elements we're talking about. This is iridium right here. And when they put 1,776 iridium atoms onto this plate of tungsten and allowed it to warm to room temperature and measured where the atoms went, out of 1,776 times, they found that virtually all of the atoms arranged themselves at two quadrants away from each other. None of them, none of them here apply, uh, arrange themselves any closer than two of these quadrants. They repulsed each other if they try to get closer. The normal interreaction between an atom is 1.8 to 2.2 angstroms. These squares are actually 3.17 angstroms, and there's two of them. So that's 6.34 angstroms. So the atoms are so far apart, there's no chance they're sharing electrons. There's no chance they're sharing chemistry. But they're actually bound at about three or four times the distance they should be to be in a metal. And they say it's like there's a Coulomb wave coming off the atom. It's like this atom is sitting there going jitterbug, 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 jitterbug. 
and there's a wave coming off of it. And the next atom nestles in that wave. Exactly 6.34 angstroms. But there's no chemistry, there's no crystalline energy. It just nestles in the wave. And then it goes jitterbug, 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 and it produces the wave also. And the next atom nestles in the wave. And so you end up with atom after atom after atom, and they're arranging themselves basically in this dimension. There are hardly any atoms out here. There's, there's, a, there's a few right there in this dimension, but the bulk of them are in one dimension. So actually, it's a, it's a system that actually becomes two-dimensional, this way and this way. So it actually becomes in two dimensions with atoms sitting exactly 6.34 angstroms apart, but with no chemistry. Now, they didn't know what they were seeing, but what they were seeing is a high spin atom, because in the monotonic state, it goes to the high spin state, produces a Coulomb wave, and now in the same wave that energy, in the same way that energy goes around one atom forever and ever and ever, you ever ask yourself why an electron runs on an atom forever and ever and ever, why it never gets tired, it just runs forever and ever and ever? Now, energy can sit on this wave and ride the wave forever and ever and ever. Okay, in the same way it runs around one atom, now it can run around the mini atom system forever and ever and ever. Why are we not on the screen? Here we come, here we come, here we come. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, that's a very important paper. You know, it's actually a direction of repulsion. There's attraction between atoms and then repulsion between the atoms. So you repulsion, attraction, repulsion, attraction, and then it kind of settles down. And it runs by nuclear power forever and ever and ever. So these high spin atoms can sit here and they actually resonance couple together, but at distance but they now have light bundles around each atom. Okay, now remember what I told you about superconductors? If it's in the high spin state and the Meissner field touches the high spin state of another atom, then they can act as one. And that's exactly what they theorized, that the high spin state should be a superconductor. Let's go to the next slide. All right, this is Physical Review C, Volume 41, Number 4, April 1990. This is the Niels Bohr Institute over in Copenhagen, Denmark. Okay, this is once again, you all remember Niels Bohr, he's a contemporary of Einstein's. He can, they talked about Bohr magnetrons and electron orbitals and all. He's one of the guys that pioneered this work. Anyway, this is, this is the National Labs over in, in Copenhagen, Denmark, and they're actually talking about some of these configurations become strongly bound by deforming the system. In particular, new shell gaps appear by inducing a quadrupole distortion in the nuclear shape, where the ratio of the major to minor axis is two to one. Such deformations play an important role in the process of spontaneous fission, where the two to one configuration connected with the second minimum of the fission bar barrier. Anyway, they're talking about all the shape configurations that occur when you get into this. Discovery of superdeformed rotational bands during the past years opened a new chapter in the study of nuclei under conditions of extreme deformation and angular momentum, and that superdeformed bands are populated at the highest spins. Okay, so what I'm just re repeating again what I told you high spin, superdeformed, and they're interested in these because a spontaneously fission. Now, one thing I have to tell you people is we decided when I was doing the DC arc work, that hey, we've got a way here to get it to metal. We bought this, what we call an arc furnace. It's a big furnace, about two and a half, three feet across. We brought it in. It actually has a water-cooled copper crucible that sits in this furnace, and a big lid that shuts down on it, seals around it, and it has a tungsten and electrode hanging down in it. And we put 30 grams of our white powder in there, and I said, you know, I'm gonna strike this arc and I'm going to burn it for two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, six minutes, seven, I don't care if it takes ten minutes. I'm going to burn it just like an arc welder, and I'm going to burn it, and I'm going to burn it, and I'm going to burn it until I literally cause these atoms to say, I give up. I give up, I'll go ahead and go to metal. <laughs> and so, those, are, those, those of you who already heard this, I'm sorry, but anyway, 
I struck, I got this furnace in, pulled the vacuum, put in inert gas, there's a plasma gas in it. I got all ready, I got a hold of the tungsten electrode and I struck the arc and it went Bzzz! and it stopped. Opened it up and the tungsten electrode was molten, totally gone from the machine. And I said, well, you know, there's got to be a, a malfunctioning electrode. This just can't be right. So I got another set, set of uh, powder. I put 30, mil 30 milligrams of powder in again. I sent for a new electrode. They sent me two new electrodes. I mounted a new tungsten electrode in it, pulled a vacuum on the system, got it all ready to go, put the inert gas in it, struck the arc, and it went shut down again. I took it up, and the tungsten electrode's gone again. Now, people, if you add the BTUs of heat that had to be produced when I struck that arc, the BTUs of heat that came out of this machine is about a thousand times greater than the heat that should have come out of it on, based on the DC arc. There was no air, there was no oxygen, there was no chemistry. It was literally coming out of the white powder. And it was about a thousand times at least more energy than should have been coming out of it. And you know, to melt a tungsten electrode the size of my thumb in a less than a second, just to melt it totally, the people who manufactured this melting furnace guaranteed it would work for 450 meltings. <laughs> and I couldn't get a second out of it. And I said, you know, this just this just isn't right. Something's wrong. So anyway, I put the third electrode in it. I put another sample of powder in. I said, look, something's not right here. What if this stuff is radioactive? So we went and got a scintillator and I brought it in and I checked the stuff and it had no radiation at all. Now this was capable of measuring alpha, beta, and gamma emission. No radiation. And so I went over to the molten metal, no radiation. I said, okay. So I held it right next to this arc furnace and when he struck the arc, tremendous gamma emission came out of it. Gamma is the bad stuff. Gamma is the really you know, powerful radiation. It goes through lead sheets, goes through brick walls. It's stuff that kills you. And this just blasted it. Now fortunately it only lasted just a fraction of a second. It was all over. And then we went over to our beaker sitting on the wall. And they're all full of bubbles and fractures and you pick them up and they fall apart. We go to our wiring on our, our electrical system on the wall and it's all crumbling and going to powder. And I said, guys, we don't do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and we actually can begin to laugh and call these the female elements. <laughs> that you do not force these elements to do anything they don't want to do. <laughs> Anyway, uh, let's go. Let's uh, let's go to the next one. Yeah. Anyway, this is out of Scientific American. The reference on the bottom down here. So let's raise it up. Yeah, Scientific American, October 1991. This is the spectra of super deformed nuclei. Now they use an example of mercury 192 and mercury 194, which are both radioactive isotopes. So, you know, you say, well, this doesn't mean anything. But I just showed you papers that said ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, and silver, osmium, iridium, platinum, gold, and mercury will do this. So everything you're reading here applies to those. So what does it say? Let's lower it down just a little bit. It says, uh, Researchers at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory have been finding that rapidly spinning nuclei with different masses have similar, if not exactly the same, moments of inertia. Something's going on, says Frank S. Stevens, a physicist at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and for reasons we don't understand yet. Now this is really something, people, to get an American physicist that doesn't understand something. <laughs> I, I, they'll never admit they don't understand something. Anyway, a spinning nucleus results from an off-center collision between two nuclei that fuse to form a rapidly spinning elongated body. Well, that's the way they do it, but Mother Nature has done it already millions of years ago in the belly of the Earth. The deformed nucleus can take the shape of an American football, a doorknob, or possibly even a banana, depending on the collision energy in the nuclei. In a typically deformed nucleus, the long axis exceeds the two short axis by a factor of 
of 1.3 to 1. Nuclei whose long axis is about twice that of its short ones are called super deform. It is in these super deform nuclei that curious goings on have taken place. A spinning super deform nucleus slows down the discrete steps each time emitting gamma rays. So, if you take this form of the elements and you put it under high energy and you say, I'm going to make these things go back to low spin state, you either get gamma rays, which you don't want to be around, or it fissions, which you don't want to be around. You got Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or you got deadly gamma emission. Either choice is no good. So, you know, this, I wanted you to see this because here's the Scientific American telling you exactly what I said was going on, that this was serious stuff. If you work with this very long, you're going to end up either becoming very sick, you're going to start having deformed babies. This isn't the kind of stuff you want to work around. This is real serious material. It's also why when the patent office got involved with me, they just said, Dave, we want you to tell us everything you know. We're not going to let you go to patent pending here in the U.S. until you literally take gold and make the white powder out of it. And so I went to Argonne National Laboratories and I, they, they, tried, they tried to get it approved by their attorneys because I said, you have to make the white powder of gold from gold or else you won't know it's gold. If I bring you white powder, you don't know it's gold. You've got to make it from gold, the only way you know it's gold. But their attorney said, that's chemistry, and you don't need to do chemistry. You can go to any lab and do chemistry. So I asked Roger Popel, the head of ceramics and superconductivity at, at Argonne National Labs. I said, Roger, I need you to make it, though. And so Roger said, Dave, why don't you go to Mike McNall and Steve Daniluk, who are personal friends of mine. They have a lab here in Chicago. Have them make the white powder gold for you. Sign the affidavits for the patent office, and I will receive that as gold if they tell me they made it from gold. Now, Mike McNallan is an MIT metallurgical chemist. Okay, he's got the excellent credentials. Over the phone, I, I faxed him the procedures. He bought yellow gold, 99.99 pure gold, and he made the white powder of gold. After he made the white powder of gold, he sent it for analysis. It analyzed to be silicon alumina. <laughs> and what he wrote in his affidavit is, I don't know what the heck's going on here, but I know that I only have gold here. I have no explanation for why it analyzes not to be gold. However, every property is as, as described by Mr. Hudson, and I made it from pure gold, therefore I assume it's gold. And so that's the affidavit he signed for the patent office. Well, they get claimed I could go to patent pending if I delivered that. Then after they got that, they said, well, we changed our mind. <laughs> now we want you to take the white powder gold back to yellow gold. Now understand, people, this was a materials patent. It was not a procedural patent. It was a materials patent. I was patenting these elements in this state. I said, I showed you how to take apples and make applesauce. And now you want me to take the applesauce back to an apple. Now that's pretty tough. Just take some applesauce. I want to see you make the apple. <laughs> but believe it or not, I worked three years. I do know how to do that now. But when you understand what this stuff is, when you understand this is a way of producing gamma level energy with a DC arc from a non-radioactive material, do you realize the firing weapons you could make for Star Wars? you realize the lasers that could be built with this that shoot right through anything and kill everybody in the building and never hurt the building? And this is really a serious weapon and you don't need Qaddafi or Hussein playing with this stuff. Okay? So I decided I didn't think the Department of Defense needed it. <laughs> anyway, in, in 1993, I quit pursuing the patents. So anybody who says, well, I'm trying to find your patent, I can't find it, Dave. In 1993, I quit pursuing the patents. If you don't continue to pump money into them every year, you don't get to continue the patent. So even though I was issued nine countries worldwide, I'm no longer pursuing those patents. Under advice of an attorney, he said, Dave, they can never grant a patent to anyone else that will ever apply to you. 
And so, you know, other people can, 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 can use it, but you never can be having a patent enforced against you because you've applied for it and been turned down. That's all I ever wanted anyway, okay? And they said, Dave, if you go on and if you're worried about them coming in and filing a nuclear patent, all you have to do is show that you've talked publicly to people about it, and it's in the public domain, and then they never can enforce that against you. So you've got to figure out why I'm talking to you, aren't you? <laughs> there's a method to my madness. We got a videotape, there's a date on the tape, you all are my witnesses, so I may subpoena every one of you. <laughs> anyway, let's go to the next slide. You liked that, did you? <laughs> okay. Uh, why is everybody so interested? This is a, actually a, a college textbook on nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometry published in 1963-64. People working with nuclear magnetic resonance in the 50s and 60s learned a whole lot of things about the nuclear moment of the nucleus. They found that with the application of six, 700,000 gals to a nucleus, they can actually squish the nucleus so hard together that it spin flips to the high spin state. They can actually physically deform it with a magnetic field. And then they release that field, they read the resonance as it comes back down. Well, one of the things they learned is right here. This is talking about the relaxation phenomenon. It says there is another effect called spin-spin or transverse relaxation operative in solids. This involves transfer of energy from one high energy nucleus to another. There is no net loss of energy. And that's the key, people. That's why everybody in the world is working on this because they know that high spin atoms theoretically should be superconductors. They should be like hot potato, hot potato, hot potato, hot potato, hot potato. They pass energy from one high spin atom to the next with no net loss of energy. And they know this. And see, if you can find a whole bunch of atoms that will stay in the high spin state without the application of hundreds of thousands of Gauss field, which is enough energy to push electricity all the way across the country anyway, so it's kind of esoteric. But if you've got atoms that will stay in the high spin state with no external magnetic field, then theoretically, you should have a superconductor. Okay, so that's why everybody's so interested in this. Why they don't say that in their papers? Why don't they just come out and admit what they're working on this for? They just don't tell us. Anyway, let's go to the next slide. This is Physical Review C, Volume 41, Number 4, April 1990. Once again, the good old Niels Bohr Institute and the University of Milano in uh, Italy. Anyway, what they're talking about here is, is the normal and super deformed nuclei. Keyword here, super deformed nuclei. Uh, and on down here, where they're finally going to admit why they're interested in this. Let's raise it up a little bit. It has been conjectured that the usual Cooper instabilities, all right, what do I mean by Cooper instability? The Cooper pair, Barding, Cooper, Schreifer, the BCS theory of superconductivity, the Cooper pair, that the usual Cooper instability will not exist anymore in small particles containing a reduced number of fermions like e.g. metallic particles. Therefore, superconductivity should disappear for particles in the quantal size effects. A regime, when the energy difference between two discrete one electron states is comparable to the energy gap of the superconducting state, this means the small superconductor with fewer than about 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5th electrons, as well as e.g. atomic nuclei, should be strongly affected by quantal size effects. Uh, what's that say? It's a big mouthful of words. It's the reason why I had to file patents on the state of matter in the high spin state, which is one patent, then I had to file another set of patents on the resonance coupled system of quantum oscillators resonating in two dimensions. So I filed on gold and I filed on S orms of gold. I filed on platinum but I filed on S orms of platinum, which is actually the mini atom system. In other words, the word superconductor is like the word army. You can't have a one man army. You have to have many men to have an army. The word superconductor is a mini atom phenomena. It's not a one atom phenomena. Okay, that's why I had to have two patent applications. How many atoms? They theorize somewhere around 10 to the fourth to 10 to the fifth electrons. So that's quite a few atoms. Now you understand why if the government labs are making these atoms 
at one atom at a time every day or so, and they need 10 to the fourth to 10 to the fifth electrons, there's probably three to four electrons per atom that, that superconduct, I mean, that, that can go into Cooper pairs, then that means they're going to be quite a few years before they get enough atoms to vet, measure it and see if they got a superconductor or not. But they're working on it. <laughs> They'll be there. Okay, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> 